Mike Freeman. Um, I'm with a group called Rocket Mountain Innisfere, where we uh, work with technology startups. And as it turns out, I know a whole host of folks here today, so it's great. Um, this is um, going to be a fun session, really fast, quick presentations on innovative ideas and topics. Uh, here's some fun things. Did anybody end up um, Ignite presentations like this as modeled after that? Just raise your hand. What's the fun thing about being at, at an Ignite presentation? Well, that, that's not fun, though. But you can do whatever you want. You can, you can yell stuff. You don't agree with it. You can boo them. If you like it, you clap. They only have seven minutes. You interrupt them, they got to stay on the game. So that's the fun part. So it's after lunch. You guys should definitely jump in and cause a little havoc here. Um, so uh, how this will work is the presenters will come up. They'll do a quick seven-minute pitch. Uh, and then there will be a, a very fast transition. So there's not a lot of interaction. So you definitely should um, tackle these guys and have some fun and you know, keep, keep the blood moving after lunch. Um, but that, I think we're just going to jump into it. Uh, Marcia, do you want to come up and, and start with LBJs? Okay. okay, great. We manufacture plastic tubing and fittings that are used to connect tubing. And if you think about most any piece of equipment, it um, could perhaps be flowing air or fluid. So you think about beverage equipment, you think about medical equipment, automobiles. Most any piece of equipment has something flowing through it, whether that's air or fluid. And hopefully they're using our tubing and our connectors um, for that. So, uh, so we manufacture, we have about 30 molding machines. We do injection molding, and we have six extrusion lines that we use to manufacture our tubing. We've been in business 27 years, and we've always been in Colorado. Um, so let's see. So I guess we'll go to the next slide. We were asked to talk about, um, oh yes, this is. So, disruptive technologies, and as Bob mentioned in the earlier presentation, 3D printing has really changed our business, and we use plastic 3D printing every day, where someone walks in with a concept for what will eventually be a molded part. And they say, I'd like to make this part. And the next morning, we can have it printed out, show them the part and say, is this what you meant? And so we take it from a sketch to a part that we can test for fit, form, and function within a, within a day, which has been very impressive and really gives us an, an advance and a lead um, uh, on our competition. So, What's happening though is um, 3D printing is evolving to um, 3D printing of metals. And when we mold a part, um, we have to build a mold like this that shoots, we shoot the plastic into the mold, it forms the part, parts drop out, um, and we have a saleable product. Um, the challenge is that uh, it takes tool makers weeks and months to create these, and sometimes years create these molds for us. And when uh, plastics kind of moved to China, a lot of the mold makers and the craftsmen that have built these molds for years retired and, and uh, were no longer needed. And we didn't continue to train tool makers. So we've kind of been in a, a lull for many years. And it, it makes us less competitive because it takes longer to get these molds built. Well, with new 3D technology, we're able to now print these metal pieces that become molds. And we'll be able to, um, here in the near future, when it continues to evolve and we can get the surface finishes that we need um, for a very precise molding, um, we'll be able to print our molds within a matter of hours or days instead of months and years, which will then really allow us to, to be competitive and get molded products to customers that much faster. So that's the, the technology that will dramatically change our industry. So then they asked, what can we do to help a company like Eldon James here as, uh, in this economy and or for economic development? And I have to say, we used to promote Colorado when we travel around the world and do trade shows. We always have a a picture of the mountains, and you know how it is at trade shows when you're trying not to make eye contact with the people in the booth, you're just trying to move through, 
get through as many books as you can. <laughs> well, as an exhibitor, you know, we always found that featuring Colorado and being a Colorado manufacturer was an icebreaker. We would get people who stop and they start, going, oh, you're from Colorado. Wow, my family has the most fabulous vacation. Let me tell you about it. And they start to paint this picture, and you start to imagine what that looked like. And there's family in Colorado. <laughs> and um, we're finding that uh, we're not comfortable with the questions that are being asked now when we feature that we're from Colorado. People walk up and go, what the heck happened to Colorado? <laughs> you guys have come on the pot. And <laughs> we're not quite sure what to say anymore, so we don't feature the fact that we're from Colorado. So I'm reaching out to you to say whatever it is that you can do, please help promote the Colorado that I think we all love, that we all grew up in, that we are all proud of. Um, it's people like this that we try to hire and recruit to come to work for us, people who are raising families. And we're now starting to get feedback of, hey, I'm not sure I want to move to Colorado. <laughs> is that going to be a good place to raise my family? So we really need to, to overcome what's recently happened to our image. And I think hey, we go to Germany and we get those strange questions about what's going on in Colorado and what, how's that impacting you? Because um, these are the, the young families that, that we want to hire and recruit and bring to work for us. Um, so I guess what I'll put on my my gravestone when I pass away is something that I've told my children over and over and over again. Um, is be selective with those that you commute, that you associate with, because that's what you become. Thank you. So I'm a I'm an allergical material scientist by training, so I'm used to giving presentations that are really boring to most people, except the ones <laughs> in my field, so um, this quick seven minute one is, is a whole new concept. I'm going to try my best. Um, so, uh, this is supposed to be a movie. I'm not sure if it's going to play. So basically, it's a F-22 fighter aircraft taking off, landing, being refueled, and I think that's pretty awesome. So that's why I titled that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Move on to the next one. There we go. This one's working. This is the last launch. I think this is pretty fantastic. Good representation of the aerospace industry. And the reason I'm showing some of these things is because I've personally been involved in the little bits and pieces of these technologies that make it happen. This here is an attempt to deploy a reflector in space. The hub drives the six bolted ribs to form a structure that supports the gold mesh reflector surface. is 20 yards in diameter, so it's a huge structure. So what, what enables all this awesomeness? And uh, so this is supposed to be, you know, kind of an impromptu thing. Well, things have to last longer. They have to be slippery and they have to be hard. And how does that happen? Well, that's, that's where my company comes into play, Tribal Logics. We make hard and low friction. <laughs> This is a movie of a coating process that you see on the bottom. Over there on the right is the coating chamber that is used. And what we do is we literally take atoms of materials, recombine them on the surface of parts to give them properties that make them harder, what we say, bricious, low friction surfaces. So there's some examples. There's rocket engines, some automotive parts, 
uh, fasteners for space implants. So contributions. I've worked in uh, industry. I've worked in NASA. Boy, this is going a lot quicker than I thought. Uh, I worked for the Air Force. Now I'm a small business. I'm also a professor at the Colorado School of Mines. So I've kind of had a unique perspective on this industry. Um, some of these direct uh, impacts I've had is the coatings that we do. Uh, well, first of all, they're all for precision machining in an extreme environment. So, I guess we're on to the next slide here. Uh, <laughs> key ingredients for success. I see, this is my perspective. You have to have research and development. These, these technology and ideas have to come from somewhere. And there has to be competition. And I grew up during the end of the space race and definitely the heart of the Cold War. And what I saw was there's some really good competition then. And out of it came some new industries. Then those new industries started supporting existing industries, and it kind of grew like that. Whereas in a stagnant economy, we just have the same thing. We sell each other pizzas and real estate and insurance, and things don't just stay the same, they go from bad to worse. And I think this is a better model of growth, a strong economy. So the Soviet Union came up with coatings, that coating technology that I showed earlier is from the Soviet Union. They're trying to get coatings inside of gun barrels. Cold War ended, we got the technology, and all of a sudden our cutting tools are lasting five times a year, which then enables the aerospace industry. Next thing you know, we're sending a spaceship to Mars. And yet, with that there, we're getting new technologies, new discoveries. So in my mind, this is the way to grow, not uh, being stagnant. So technology is key. Well, this one can go fast enough. So uh, I was also asked to to comment on the future of the aerospace industry. And you might have heard these things, but it's true. Everything has to be faster, better, cheaper, smaller, lighter, and we want to go further. A good example is the way we used to collect intelligence. We used these large, goofy balloons, and now we have UAVs that literally fit in the palm of your hand that gather all kinds of these intelligence. So as far as barriers, the aerospace industry, and I probably should have started at the and it's expensive stuff, really expensive stuff. And the return on investment is very long. So that, I think, discourages uh, good investment. Uh, there's probably a lack of qualified employees at this point uh, due to the lack of interest. It's not, when I was a kid, the whole space industry, airplanes, all that, was really fascinating. And now, uh, it's okay, but most kids aren't that interested. Uh, and then some of the indiscriminate cuts that we get from the federal side doesn't help. Uh, so what could government do to help? Well, uh, we're a big fan of the SBIR programs, which is a federal program where you, uh, you get proof of concept funding and it actually develop products from that that are commercialized now. Uh, the tax code stinks. We need to update that. It's a small business owner. I get punished all the time for things I shouldn't be. Uh, we should encourage more U.S. citizens to go into science and engineering. Most of my students aren't U.S. citizens, and it's a real problem. They can't move on to some of these aerospace companies. And then we should also encourage exploration of extreme environments, because through that is where we really challenge ourselves and learn. And that's something that government should challenge us as a whole. Say, let's go to the moon. That was a huge challenge, and we made it. And through that, all kinds of really great things that are part of our lives today. So I think that's about seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jay Kershavi. I'm a Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for Denver South Economic Development. We represent the I-25 corridor from roughly 225 down through Lone Tree, home to uh, the Denver Tech Center and 12 other business parks which basically are uh, in, in aggregate home to six of the nine Fortune 500 companies in Colorado, 20,000 other companies, 200,000 employees, and about 20% of the state's economic output. Uh, my role within the organization is to create industry vertical specific initiatives to support fast growth entrepreneurship. And on my third day on the job, I would say, I arrived to find something that looked like that on my desk. It was a, a benchmarking survey that Denver South had just completed 
uh, showing how Colorado stacked up with a number of other key areas in the country in the healthcare industry. Uh, despite its daunting size, there was some fantastic information in that, in that report that led us down a really interesting path into some very interesting ideas. What that, pro that uh, research project taught us was that the healthcare industry is undergoing transformational change. At 17% of national GDP going to healthcare, it probably couldn't be happening fast enough. Thirdly, that technology was a big uh, opportunity to uh, move or address some of those big challenges. And then also that there was a big shift in investment dollars towards digital health and health IT products. Mobile apps, wearable tech, telehealth, telemedicine, big data analytics, things like that. It also showed us that the, uh, the future of healthcare is really mobile. As of seven years ago, we've all now got a patient engagement device in our pockets at all times. It's changing what we expect from our healthcare industry, and it's driving a tremendous amount of investment in that space. $2.3 billion by the end of Q2 of this year nationally, and you can see it's just skyrocketing. What we also realized from that process was that there wasn't an organization in Colorado that was, our, that was providing leadership to this emerging uh, segment of companies. And so we, along with some other partners, launched a group called the Prime Health Collaborative in July of 2012 started coalescing the ecosystem around digital health companies, the ecosystem of resources that were available, had monthly meetups, uh, annual digital health summit, and started doing some in-depth research on where Colorado stacks up. The great news, we're already organically number six in the nation for digital health startups. We've identified 110 companies in that space, and this organization really has an opportunity to play that critical bridge role between the healthcare industry and the tech industry. As we started digging in, uh, we've worked with a tremendous uh, consultant, Jeffrey Nathanson, who I'm sure many of you know, to do basically the first, uh, first in-depth cluster analysis on this uh, space. What we learned in that process was that there is a great, great dynamic industry for digital health in Colorado. Uh, there's, a, there's been major exits already to date. There's a core top tier of companies that have already raised north of 15 million in uh, venture investment or institutional investment. And critically important, these bottom three rows are uh, representative of a group of about 20 companies that have already raised significant angel rounds and are nearing uh, Series A. We believe that that's gonna be a substantial economic development opportunity for Colorado but it's gonna take a lot of work. Um, these companies on the bottom left here, these are some of the needs of these companies. We pulled together the representatives of all these companies, to talk to them. They need financing and they need it from sources that understand the complexities of the healthcare industry, and they need connections. They need opportunities to pilot new projects and uh, create new products alongside organizations like the CIO of Centura or Kaiser Permanente or Aetna, folks like that. So we've created a number of programs to start bridging that gap. We created the searchable digital health directory and identified which companies had which technology capabilities. And then we created a program called Prime Source where we went out on behalf of that community of 110 or so companies and encouraged the leadership in the C-suites of these major healthcare systems to start participating and hear pitches and start collaborating with these uh, digital health startups. And it's been tremendous. Uh, we also realized in that process that we needed a better way to vet out the companies that we're making those introductions to. And so we created a program called the Digital Health Challenge. We launched it in June. Uh, the Colorado Health Foundation provided $150,000 in award money. It was essentially a business plan competition, but critically, it created an opportunity for us to vet out those companies and create a report uh, that was, uh, I guess, analyzed by a group of about 40 subject matter experts online. And the event culminated in two critical events. On September 9th, we held a digital health venture showcase where we had the top 14 companies uh, came to town, uh, came to Denver, and pitched to a room of investors from around the country. It was the first time that had been done in Colorado. And then on the, and then importantly, last Wednesday, or two Wednesdays ago, on 17th, we, had the, we held the marquee event for Denver Startup Week at a place called Industry, a co-working space in Rhino. And we had about 400 of our friends uh, in attendance with the top six companies for the access track pitching their pilot proposals 
to a panel of payers and providers, and the top four were selected. We got them placed with host institutions, and then the Colorado Health Foundation uh, provided $100,000 to offset the cost of implementing those pilots. It's the first time it's been done in the country. Um, we're really excited about uh, all the developments that have gone on around this. Prime Health Collaborative has essentially gone from an idea on paper two years ago to a thriving network of more than 500 healthcare executives, clinicians, tech entrepreneurs, investors, and technologists themselves, all dedicated to this idea of putting Colorado on the map nationally as a leading hub for digital health innovation. We, this event was a great kind of uh, galvanizing event for that effort. We gave out big fake checks. We gave out a briefcase full of fake cash. <laughs> it was also the first time we were aware of that. We, that's what's been done in Colorado. Um, but so in addition to uh, creating this, this excitement, we've also, uh, we believe, started something that could really evolve into something special. We're in the process of standing Prime up on its own. Uh, to be a standalone organization and we're securing board seats and fundraising around that opportunity. So if anybody's interested in participating, please reach out. Thanks. So uh, uh, I just really interesting uh, in this talk <clears throat> only because uh, what you know Jake and his organization and some other people are doing in digital health. Um, there's a handful of people um, leading a charge in Colorado on technology innovation for oil and gas. And uh, this summer we had a uh, great opportunity to highlight um, seven Colorado-based companies and six companies from Canada at the Colorado Oil and Gas Association Conference. Uh, next year it's going to be a main track in the conference. So if you have oil and gas startup uh, companies in sensing, um, in methane detection, air quality, uh, certainly hardcore technology around drilling, um, definitely let me know because we want to find out who those companies are and make sure we expose those uh, companies to the oil and gas industry. Um, let's see, I forgot who's next. I got, oh, Paul. Um, Mana. So, uh, Paul, yeah, I, can, I have nicknames for him too. <laughs> right. uh, so, I actually know Paul for quite a long time, his brother. And they've got a great company. I just have to say 15 second story. There's uh, Brinkman Partners with a different spelling in the, uh, in the Broomfield Tech Center. And I was in a meeting, I walked in, I was like, oh my god, they've expanded to Denver in this great office. And I walked in, it was the wrong brink. I had no idea what I was talking about, I was trying to find this guy. It was very funny. OK, thanks. All right. All right, I'd like to start every meeting the same way. So everybody stand up, please, real quick. And if you give me a round of applause, that way, no matter what I say. Thank you, thank you. I've already accomplished my goal, so <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Paul Brinkman, I'm a co-founder, CEO of Brinkman Partners, headquarters for Fort Collins. We have 115 people in Fort Collins. Our work stretches from Fort Collins, Boulder, Denver, uh, about half the works in the Denver metro area. Um, so I'm also the former board chair of the Northern Colorado Economic Development Corporation. So I think it's nice to be back in a room with a bunch of economic development people. We'll, we'll find out that also. Um, so you can go ahead. All right, I want everybody to think back to 2009, 2010. I know most of us have tried to put that out of our mind. If this conference was held back then, we'd all be back in the bar drinking heavily, I'm sure. Um, but back in that time, unemployment peaked at about 10%. We were losing 300 to 400,000 jobs a month. And we had about 4 million foreclosures in that year. So if you look at what we've developed, it's a business model that we believe brings innovation and we think is the future of our industry, the real estate construction and, and engineering industry. It's, it's really taking what's a fairly segregated market, um, and traditionally you have a contractor, you have a developer, you have a real estate broker, you have a bank, and what we've done is brought that all under one roof to be able to solve our clients' real estate problems. And you can see what integrated service is being for us. It's an innovative way to solve real estate solutions. We think this, this vertically integrated model works for most industries, and we believe it really hasn't been successfully accomplished in the real estate and construction industry. And you can see it there. Go ahead. So for us, what did that mean? We could come in and help this client in a way that nobody else could. There was a market opportunity the market in Boulder, there had not been a hotel built in Boulder in 10 years. The St. Julian was the last hotel built. So there wasn't demand for hotels in Boulder. But given the economic conditions and given the traditional model in the marketplace, 
Nobody could figure out how to help this small family hotel operating company. So what did we do? We came in with our integrated model. We helped them successfully uh, get entitlements in the city of Boulder. Anybody here from Boulder? I gotta be careful. All right. Boulder is very, yeah, very helpful in working. It was, it was a great experience. <laughs> Um, but no, it was, I mean, this had been entitled before and we were able to get it re-entitled again. Um, the were short equity. We as an organization were able to come to the table with about a million dollars of equity to get the project moving forward. On the debt side, they, had no, they didn't really have any relationships and at the time nobody would lend. We introduced them to an SBA 504 loan program and we were able to successfully get the debt in place for the project. A value engineering, I mentioned $2 million over budget. With our team and with our technology, we were able to help them value engineer the project. Um, lead through the uh, development process and then also go through the lead process. This is a gold certified, lead, a gold lead uh, hotel. I believe the first lead hotel in the city of Boulder. So we were able to manage the lead process. Um, one of the most advanced hotels from a sustainability standpoint in the Boulder area and successful on, on time delivery. So the story of Brinkman, I mean, really we set out to create an organization that was an innovative business model that could create value in the industry and was non-traditional. One, two, we wanted to try to figure out how do we use technology in a fairly traditional industry to solve problems. And three, and one of the things I'll touch on is culture. In our industry, culture is very, very important. Go ahead. So I want to touch on barriers, barriers in our industry. You know, who, who when they were born and, and grew up in elementary school said, hey, I want to go into construction, you know? Anybody here? So I think there's some barriers we need to address. One, innovation in our industry is weak. Two, the use of technology um, is not very advanced. Three, the perception of our industry. We really need to support the perception and the training within our industry. And lastly, regulations. As we all know, it becomes harder and harder and more costly to build projects and to get projects through municipalities and we need to figure out effective and efficient ways uh, to accomplish that. Two, I want to touch briefly go ahead on, on two elements within technology. Um, the first one build, being building information modeling. Most of you have heard in this model here, you can see uh, the green is the ductwork. Um, we've got some lights. And really what building information modeling allows us to do is to put elements of construction into three dimensions to make sure that we're planning and sequencing and effectively building a building prior to it going up. What does that do? That reduces costs, reduces conflicts, it reduces the amount of labor necessary for it, which one of the things I also want to touch on is the, the upcoming labor shortage. And when we start to use technology, it's a way to really address some of the labor shortages that are coming in our marketplace. The other is um, lean construction, I go ahead and lean practices. You know, Toyota really developed the concept of lean in the automobile industry. Um, and for us, it's how do you take a lot of the technologies in lean and apply them to a traditional or, uh, in, uh, industry in construction. Uh, this being Prescient, who's heard of Prescient in here? Prescient's um, an organ a company here in, in Colorado that was founded to really um, re figure out a way to build modules in a warehouse. They can come out within a 132nd accuracy, so it reduces schedules, uh, increases quality, and reduces costs. Um, I mentioned a little bit of culture, and this is one thing that's really at the heart of what we've done as an organization, and I think is something that's been missing from our industry. And I think it's something that obviously is applicable to, to many industries, is, is how do you really develop a culture um, that's supportive of maintaining re or retaining and recruiting people? At? And most of you spend a lot of your focus on retention and recruitment. And recruitment is always a sexy part of economic development. But the, one of the harder things is retention. And for us, building a strong culture is a way to keep and retain people. Uh, the average age of a worker in the United States is 42 years old right now. In the construction industry, it's 46. 20 years ago, the average age of the construction employee was 34 years old. Our company, our average age is 36. So what we're trying to do is build a culture that's supportive of training, recruiting, retaining people into our industry who may no longer want to be in this industry or in the past weren't interested in the industry. And how do you do that? You do that by creating different cultures. Go ahead. You can just look through a couple of these. Um, the one thing, next slide please. What I want to touch base is another thing that's applicable um, and something that really needs to be focused on in our industry 
Um, but I think tech and other industries have really built um, this model and got a lot further with it. And that's really just a different way of working. For us, we're, re we're building a new headquarters, and as part of that, it's really rethinking the old model. You know, the old model would be traditional offices, and, and tech and healthcare and a lot of other have figured out how do you create spaces for collaboration? How do you integrate technology into your workspace? How do you create flexibility in an ever-changing marketplace? And for us, how we're building our new headquarters is a perfect example of what's missing in our industry. Do something different, be non-traditional, be innovative, and create a different environment. So how can you support and help uh, the real estate and construction industry. Um, as I mentioned, I think the labor shortage is a huge one. You know, So with that, I think we've got to advance innovation. We've got to advance technology in our industry. It includes BIM, things like BIM and lean practices. Um, I think the perception of construction industry in the marketplace, and that starts with probably K through 12 education. Um, construction, real estate, engineering. We, we, talk, we heard a little bit about uh, aerospace. You know, These are all high paying jobs um, good jobs, and we need to start in K through 12 and figure out how do we get these kids excited about industries that are that are dying, that the perception are dying. And then the lastly, the regulation. We heard a little bit about taxes. In our industry, regulation starts with um, you know the cost of doing business, um, mainly at the city, county, local level, and at the state level. How do we continue to support being effective with the uh, the ultimate like, products that we bring out there and the cost? It all impacts costs. So with that, I appreciate it, and uh, with some of this, maybe we can all uh, avoid another 2009. Thanks. My name is Scott Warren, the topic of my presentation today is a product that we've developed called Safe Zone. December 14, 2012, a lone gunman attacked Sandy Hook Elementary School and murdered 26 people. Three days after Sandy Hook, myself and my colleagues dedicated ourselves to developing technology for preventing gun violence. That technology is Safe Zone. The mission of Safe Zone is to save lives by preventing gun violence. In accordance with the format today, I'd like to excite three of your emotions. The first is we should all want more to be done to prevent shootings like Sandy Hook and Arapahoe High School. The second is I want you to critically evaluate our claims that we can prevent gun violence with Safe Zone. If you conclude that we can, then I hope you'll help us do so. So what does Safe Zone do? It's 2 o'clock. Do you know where the kids are? <laughs> Can't get that video to work. That's an FBI supplied video for the attack on the Navy Yard that happened approximately a year ago. What you see in that video is that our software can automatically detect firearms in surveillance video. As soon as a, as a firearm is uh, visible in, the, in a surveillance camera, we detect the presence of the, of the firearm. Simultaneously with that, we can deliver real-time video and mapping information to responders. The Navy Yard attack lasted for 70 minutes and 12 people were murdered. After action analysis shows that the responders didn't know where the threat was, what the threat activity was, and that led to additional loss of life. So the use of safe zone information in these very dangerous situations will result in low latency response and much more effective response. And that's the basis of our claim that we can save lives with safe zone. This is actually a video of, of uh, the delivery of safe zone information for live gun detection to mobile phones. So you can see on the right hand side that we can deliver images in real time that look like that. What you're noticing on the right hand side is gun detection almost immediately when the gun comes into the frame of the video. On the left hand side, you see the type of real time mapping that we can supply with the threat. So the red dot represents the position of the attacker. You might imagine that the Navy Yard shooting would have been vastly changed if this sort of information had been available to responders. It's now known after the fact that the entire attack was on video, but nobody could access the video during the attack. No responder wanted to take 70 minutes at Navy Yard. It's because they don't have the proper information. That's what we're trying to fix with Safe Zone, and we believe that we can. Safe Zone has disrupted innovation into the video surveillance market that exists today. We believe that if we can show success in a few key trial sites, that we'll get wide-scale adoption of our product. Why do we believe that? 
The market today consists of millions of surveillance cameras installed year over year with the market growing at 25 percent. And there are over 50 million video cameras installed in the United States today. Each of those video cameras is connected to a system that records the video. That leads to a number of weaknesses in this market that we believe we can disrupt and save some. The first is that video should be used in real time to respond to threats so the response can be much more effective and less late. There are underutilized resources in this market, which is one of the factors that needs to be present for a market to be disruptive. Those underutilized resources include video, include people, and actually the way the video is stored is an inefficient use of resource. Uninformed responders or underinformed responders are ineffective responders. So if we give them better information, then they'll be able to protect us better and, and we will save lives. This market has inadequate safety, particularly for active shooter events. And that's one of the things we're trying to focus on the safe zone. FBI and DHS are forecasting that we can expect an increase in the number of active shooter attacks in our country. And as you well know, we're being threatened by foreign interests that want to come and take away our quality of life by attacking the way we live. We think we can address the weaknesses in this market with disruptors that are present in our product. Automatic gun detection and informed real-time response are unique to safe zone. And as far as we know, we're the only people in the world who learned how to detect firearms and surveillance video. This will lead to the positive disruptors in this market that will benefit us all. The ability to use video in real time is extremely important in these circumstances where seconds result in loss of life. Responder and bystander safety can be vastly improved with the use of safe zone. Prevention and deterrence of gun violence. I want to point out how do we enhance safety while preserving our quality of life. Safe zone is not militarization of police forces like Ferguson. Safe zone is not stopping frisk. And Safe Zone offers to give us all something back for the loss of our privacy when surveillance video is in use, and that's enhanced safety. Barriers to adoption, I'm running out of time. Awareness who we are, disruptive markets resist. We need more trial sites, we're currently live in two places. Politics is involved. Security agencies want us to believe they have it under control. These are barriers to the adoption of our product. How can state and local governments help us? We believe that Colorado should leverage safe zone and become the global leader in gun violence prevention because of our history. Obviously, you can help us activate key trial sites, and you can help us build awareness for who we are and what we're doing. The safe zone mission is to save lives by preventing gun violence. We believe we can disrupt gun violence today. We think we can assist the state of Colorado's economy by preserving our quality of life. Human and economic losses for these attacks are enormous, and all of the 14 key industries defined by Colorado have facilities where video surveillance is in use, and that can be used to enhance personal, people safety, and property safety. I asked you in the beginning if you believe we can do this to help us. I, I, I make that appeal again. I welcome any questions or comments you have, and I thank you for your time. Good sized number of companies doing some aspects of surveillance. So this uh, this technology fits in from the advanced industry perspective really really well. Uh, our last presenter today is Alex with BiddyThink. He's going to talk about some exciting technology uh, being used for electronic reading. My name is Alex Molesky. I'm with Beneath the Ink, a Boulder based startup company. I am a developer by trade, an engineer by training, an entrepreneur by day, and a competitive break dancer by night. <laughs> now, you might be asking yourself, well, what the heck does a competitive break dancer do? We usually do a lot of stuff like this. This is the last presentation, and before you go ahead and check your email, I have two questions for you. First question, have you ever seen a bad presentation start with a backflip? No. Second question, when's the last time you read anything? I'm here to talk to you.
you about books, but not just any books, e-books. We've been reading the same way for hundreds of years. Why would we have amazing technologies like this one? Do we still read the same way we did on paper books like these? Beneath the Ink is changing the way people read and produce content. This is a book with a bank in it. In this case, it's an interactive parent image of the Taj Mahal, created by the author. But banks can contain almost anything. Now, I can spend the next five minutes telling you all about the cool things we're doing at the Ink and how we're revolutionizing reading and allowing authors to create great 3D versions of their books quickly and easily. But I'm not here to talk about that either. I'm here to talk about the future. Everyone's like, the future. Do we have holographic images in our ebooks right now? No. But here are some of the building blocks that are paving the way for the digital reading revolution. Hardware, software, and organizations. First, let's talk about hardware. Companies like Samsung, Apple, and Amazon have created amazing hardware that we can use to read books on. The problem is that 90% of the features available in this hardware aren't being utilized by ebooks today. So as far as books go, the hardware is already there. So what does the software look like? This is EPUB. EPUB is the latest and greatest in e-reading standards. In EPUB 3, you can actually embed any content that's available in a website straight into a book. So what's the problem? 80% of readers read on one of the major four distribution channels, and none of these distribution channels have adopted the EPUB 3 standard. That's where Readium comes in. Readium is an open source software platform that is showing these companies how to adopt EPUB 3 by creating a seamless example of EPUB 3 integration in their software. Organizations. But not just any organizations, brave ones. Companies like Kobo, the International Digital Publishing Forum, Spritz, and Print On Demand Global. These are companies that are leading the way to digital publishing by being innovative, creating new ways for people to read, and really pushing to have standards to be adopted. All right, so what are some of the local barriers? Some of the local barriers. First and foremost, we don't have a good publishing foundation in Colorado. Most publishing happens in New York and in London. There's also not a solid foundation for investment in publishing companies in Colorado. Most of the time, when we talk to angel investors or VCs, they say that they don't invest in publishing companies because they don't understand the industry. What are some of the global barriers? This is a huge distributed market. Sure, most of the publishing happens. Hey, is that? Yay. Sort of got that, right? Most of the publishing happens in New York and in London. However, content is created globally, which means there's a vastly distributed audience, and the marketing challenge is huge. The big A, which is Amazon, has 60% market share. And currently, they're not adopting any of the reading standards. And the chicken egg problem of technology and publishing haven't yet mixed. Currently, we don't have any good examples of enhanced ebooks in the industry. And until we have good examples, people aren't going to be buying enhanced ebooks. So, how can the government support? Right now, you're probably thinking this guy's crazy. There's so many barriers. What are they doing in this industry? However, we've been around for two years, and we're seeing major leaps and bounds happening. Because we firmly believe that you can't be a profit in your own land, and you have to take advantage of this industry while it's under chaos. We recently got a $250,000 grant from the state of Colorado to continue development. This was a great process because it made sure that we had all of our ducks in a row when we were applying for the grant. It also helps us get from zero to 60, because most of our investors that we're talking to don't want to invest in the company until we're already moving. And finally, the due diligence stand. When we're pitching to VCs and super angels, we always see a fear of doing the due diligence. Having a grant really gives us a backbone and lets us show that we've done our work, that we've done our due diligence. 
Early adoption. This is probably the most important thing that local and state governments can do to support startup companies like mine. Adopting our technologies early can give us credibility, help us with our proof of concept in a real world environment, and give us a minimum viable product to scalable platform solution because we're working with a real world industry. And finally, pushing for digital. In places like documentation, this could be legal, medical, or technical documentation, libraries, and education. So to recap, the future of digital publishing is gonna be driven by hardware, software, and brave organizations. The major barriers to entry are that the market is extremely distributed, and publishing and technology have not yet mixed. And finally, how can you help? Pushing for early internal adoption and integration, and providing funding for digital reading to local organizations who need it most. Thank you.